Great. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks a lot to the organizers for putting it all together, for inviting me. Uh, the papers in discussion have been really good so far. Uh, I hope uh, I won't now bring that to a screeching halt. Uh, so this paper uh, sketches some parts. Yeah, there's a handout coming around. It, it says at the top, it's not an outline of the argument anyway. There's just a few things I'll tell you. It'd be, they're a little long, so it's good to have them to look at. But that's all you'll need. I'll tell you when, when it might be useful to look at those. So, uh, so this paper sketches some parts of work I've been doing, mainly not about democracy, but about you know, what gets called the ideal theory, non-ideal theory, uh, debate, and political philosophy. But it fortunately comes together with some issues about the rather idealized, I think, notion of epistemic democracy. Uh, so in general, when political theory uh, constructs uh, models that are idealized in certain ways, and that can mean different things, obviously, in any case, it's going to be natural to ask whether they're of any use in practice. Of course, if there's a possibility of, of fully achieving them, then they could serve as you know, appropriate practical goals, then just head out for that. Um, even if you don't think they're fully achievable, or maybe at least not worth the cost or risk of trying to fully achieve them, these some idealized scenario, um, it might be good to try to approximate them. Get as much of it as you can, even though you don't have any hope of getting it all. But that can't be assumed, that latter thing. That if you can't get it all, you should at least get as much of it as you can. So that's going to be a big uh, theme of what I have to say. It can't be assumed that you should approximate something that would be very good. Because approximating that thing doesn't mean you'll be approximating its value, right? That's a well-known lesson from second best. A, an example I like is a, a car that's missing a brake pedal is approximately like a car with a brake pedal, but <laughs> missing most of the value. Uh, but it seems plausible as a first step, and then I'll develop this in a certain way, to identify the respects in which the status quo or some scenario uh, the ways in which it differs from the valuable model or ideal, quite apart from whether you ask, should we try to produce it, should we try to approximate it? First of all, what are the ways in which it deviates? And then I think there's some use that can be put to, the, that, that can be put to in practice. So these kind of initial points must apply to the idea of epistemic democratic deliberation because they apply to everything. Uh, some people, of course, are skeptical that there is any such thing or that any such thing is possible as epistemic deliberative democracy. But even partisans like Helen and I and some others grant that it does or would depend on the presence of a number of institutions, practices, <coughs> favorable conditions. So at least in that sense, it's you know, relatively idealized. It doesn't matter that it's super idealized. People have different views about that. So if we won't have all of the features of such a system, the preconditions and constituents, then we obviously have some reason to introduce those missing features if we can. But if we can't, or, and here's the thing I like to keep inserting, um, whether or not we can't, maybe we just know we won't um, introduce all of them, then it can't be assumed that having more of those features is better uh, than having less. So I'll divide it into two parts. Uh, first, in the first part, I'm going to explain in more detail than usual this important general point that often goes by the name of second best. I prefer to call it the fallacy of approximation for reasons I'll make clear. Um, here's a hint, it has nothing to do with second or best. Um, in part two, I'm going to turn to a second way of moving toward improvement when a system um, has features that damage its epistemic value or lacking some of the valuable features. A, a different way rather than approximating the ideal scenario, but by countervailing deviations, some deviations uh, with others. So part one, uh, the seminal treatment of second best is a famous paper by Lipsy and Lancaster. It's highly technical economic theory. Most people have only seen it in a footnote. Uh, but if you ever look up the paper, it's highly formal technical economic theory, almost impossible for normal philosophers to understand how the argument is supposed to go. Um, there's some debate about whether all the points I go on to make, which I call generalizations of the standard presentation, are implicit. I don't myself believe they are in Lipsy and Lancaster, but it doesn't matter. Some people claim that, that it's all really there in the, in the formalism. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'm, I want to draw these points out. Turns out this point about so-called second best is much more generally applicable than people tend to think when they just see the way it's usually described. So in a very simple context, um, we can see the general point about second best without any formalism or technical language in this example that I call two out of three 
pills ain't bad, question mark. So suppose you're treating a serious um, um, uh, medical condition with a cocktail of three pills each day, and you've run out of one of the three medications, but you do have the other two, you can't assume that more of those is better. You can't assume that you should at least take those two because two is better than one or zero. Why? Because there's no guarantee that two is better than one or zero. It depends on how they interact. Um, in this case, we'd be thinking about causal interactions. In the paper, I talk about how there can be non-causal interactions between valuable elements. Just um, we won't talk about that today. But obviously, one of the pills might trigger the beneficial effects of the other one, synergistic like that. Or sort of more saliently, one might neutralize the toxic potential of another one and keep it from killing you. So if you have two of your three pills, don't take them unless you check with your doctor. If there's nothing else you take away from that paper. Write that down. Right, write that down. Um, so this doesn't, of course, mean that getting more rather than less of the, impartial, of the partial list of ingredients, it doesn't mean that it'll never add value. It just means that assuming that it will is invalid reasoning. So it might, it just doesn't follow that they'll have more value, right? Sometimes they will, often they will. Um, so what I'm gonna call the fallacy of approximation is to reason as if that is good reasoning, to reason as if uh, they are guaranteed, that more is guaranteed to be better than less in that sense. Um, so I've come to think that this sort of fundamental point about complexity and value is uh, um, really severely underappreciated. And that might be because it's often presented in terms that suggest a much narrower range of application than it really has. And so that's what I want to do in this first part, is explain how much more broadly the point applies. So on the handout, here's what I call a standard formulation of second best. I hope this is familiar to people who've come across the idea of second best. It's not a quote from anyone, but in a longer treatment, I don't think it's even in this paper, I cite a few people and show that they give presentations with these features that I'm um, criticizing or going beyond. So here's a standard way of thinking of the so-called problem of second best. If there's some social scenario, so pay attention to the italicized terms, because my argument, and I won't do it all here today, is that none of those is actually crucial to the point about second best, which just increases its relevance and importance. So if there's some social scenario, including multiple contributing elements, that would together be ideal or best, but it's impossible or infeasible to produce all of them, it's not in general correct to assume that, oops, sorry, that superset thing is a little technical thing that's in the paper, not, I'm not gonna mention it in the talk. So it's not in general correct to assume that the second or next best option is to produce all of the available elements. In other words, to suppose that it is would be a fallacy. So that's right, but none of those things that seem to narrow its relevance are crucial, and I'll just mention a few of the generalizations. So the first generalization beyond that standard formulation is this, there's nothing essential about focusing on a best or ideal scenario. So suppose some scenario, call it S, will not be happening, um, since at least some of the conditions of its value aren't going to be and maybe can't be met. Someone might make the following inference, which would be a fallacy. They might say, scenario S, now remember, well, not ideal or best in any way, is good to some degree or at least less bad than the alternatives, this scenario. And not all of the contributing elements will be happening. And then somebody might reason this way. The best option then would be to produce all the ones that are available. That's the fallacy. No use of best or ideal or anything like that. Um, so the um, case where the scenario in question is an ideal of some kind, or a best case in some way, it's just a special case of the general point. It's just one example. So in political philosophy, then, you can't escape the issue or the danger of the fallacy of approximation simply because you're not talking about the best or ideal. You say, I'm not doing ideal theory, so I don't have to worry about, about that. It does not, doesn't follow. And since the issue has nothing at all to do with best, it has nothing to do with second best, because that would have something to do with best, right? So that's a good reason for not calling it the problem of second best, but I don't have any hope that, that I'll persuade people to stop calling it that. Uh, a second generalization is that while a lot of people follow Lipsy and Lancaster in speaking about this as if the question only arises if some of the elements are not available, 
or not feasible or not possible in some way. That just has nothing to do with it. This is a really important generalization, I think. Um, the underlying issue then becomes more significant if this is right. So here's the easy way to see that. Whether or not the best or the model scenario in question um, is possible, feasible, or available, suppose it's all those things, but it just won't occur. You just know it's not going to happen. Those elements are not all going to be produced. Then you still have this question, well, what should we do? Should we produce as many of the elements as possible? That would still be a fallacy. Okay. Now, these are importantly different, the difference between whether we can't have all the elements versus we just won't have all the elements, especially in moral and political philosophy, for a couple of reasons. First, just a basic point, there's lots of things that people and societies could do, they just predictably won't do. Second, some moral evaluation, maybe individual moral evaluation, maybe there's a version of this at the collective or political level, will hang on whether it was within your ability but you didn't do it. That is, there might be Many people accept an odd implies can principle at the individual level. I suspect something similar will be applicable at the social justice level. So now it might be relevant that even though you know certain things aren't going to happen, that doesn't get you off the hook. They're injustices and you could have done them. It's just that you're not going to, so now you have to worry about this fallacy of approximation. Um, a third little further generalization is that even apart from either of those things, suppose we're just for whatever reason putting the, the um, scenario aside in our thinking, the one where they're all met. We just say, well, suppose they wouldn't all be met. You'd still face the questions of what would be, what would, what would be the best thing to do in that case? Okay. Um, okay, so it's not about the best or ideal, so it's not about the second best necessarily. It's much more generally applicable. And it doesn't only come up when some of the features are unavailable or infeasible or impossible. It comes up whenever they either won't be present or you're just considering if they weren't present. So here's one little example now how this can have application in, broadly speaking, a moral or political context. And there'd be tons more examples. I start to see this everywhere now. Um, um, so I assume this is safe. Military prisons are no part of a social ideal. Okay? That's not part of ideal theory, military prisons. Now language could be a little tricky here. So at a camp called Camp Buka in southern Iraq in 2004, it was reported that, quote, the detainee to guard ratio is seven to one, uh, detainees to guards, still above the, quote, ideal five to one. <laughs> okay, so the use of ideal clearly is not signaling that we're doing ideal theory here, right? So put aside that use of the word ideal. Let's suppose now, I want to say a little more about this example. Let's just suppose that the scenario in question is some minimally adequate one. That's what we're wondering about. What's the ratio that would give us a certain minimal standard of adequacy, so ideals are not in the picture. So suppose that a certain, and this is on the handout, if you want to look at uh, any of the details, suppose that a certain standard of adequacy would be met if you had these three conditions. Let's just say seven or fewer prisoners, not always ideal, as they say, uh, but a min <coughs> minimally adequate maybe. Seven prisoners for each guard, plus 50 minutes per day of outdoor time for each prisoner, plus a half hour daily break for each guard. Suppose that would be a certain manageable, adequate scheme. But now suppose that condition A will not be met. Maybe for some reason it can't be met, or maybe you're just not gonna meet it. Maybe you don't wanna spend the money that would take. So that's off, the, that's off the table. You might be tempted, hopefully you won't anymore, you've already been taught this is a fallacy, but uh, you might be tempted to say that we should at least have as many of these good elements as possible. So we should at least have B and C if they're available. First point, that's fallacious reasoning. Maybe that would be good, maybe it wouldn't. So it doesn't follow that that would be good. But in this case, we can see how it may very well not be good, just for one possibility. Suppose the ratio is going to be higher than 7 to 1 because A is not met. It might be a disaster to have any outdoor, outdoor time at all for the prisoners. They might get out of control. right? So B and C are contributing elements to the at minimally adequate scheme, if you're not going to have A, it might be tempted to like take the other two pills at least. Don't do it, right? Or at least double check. The lesson is not never do it. It's double check and see whether they do still have their value without that third thing. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. In this case, it looks like they wouldn't. Okay, so these points in a certain sense are negative 
but they have a practical significance already because they guard against drawing invalid practical conclusions. So they're negative in a way, but that doesn't mean they're not practical. So don't do that. That's a practical thing. Okay, now I want to move to the second part, which is a certain kind of application of the idea of the fallacy of approximation, which I'm now reading that structure into um, um, a famous piece by Herbert Marcuse, which I've talked about before in work on democracy, um, a, a excellent piece called Repressive Tolerance, that was called? Yeah. Right. Um, so he exemplifies this point, I think. This is my reading of Marcuse. Um, he exemplifies this point about what I call the fallacy of approximation in the context of what he calls pure tolerance. Now, for our purposes, let's just assume that means something like broad viewpoint neutral freedom of expression. Freedom not just at the legal but at social level. Viewpoint neutral non-interference with expression. Right, a standard kind of liberal um, norm or ideal. So Marcuse says things along these lines. If, for example, one gender, or in his case, especially social class, has the power to prevail in debates irrespective of the quality of the reasons they can marshal for their positions, that's his sort of Frankfurt School way of thinking of what the problem might be, he denies that pure tolerance will promote the truth. So here he is, in effect, identifying a tempting instance of the fallacy of approximation. It goes like this. Just because, as he grants, pure tolerance would be an essential part of a certain highly desirable condition does not mean that it would be desirable without the other conditions. So you can start to fill in what the other conditions would have to be for that to have value. And he says, yeah, that's an ingredient. He admits all kinds of million stuff. He thinks million, mill tempts people to think all the other things are in place so this will have value, or to neglect the fact that some parts only have their value with the other parts. So that sounds to me just like accusing these people of the fallacy of approximation. So use is being made here of a certain, in, in by Marcuse, in a certain ideal or high standard, the kind of Frankfurt School ideal of the forceless force of the better argument is, is sort of what it is. I think Habermas gets this from, from these early Frankfurt School people. So it's a, an ideal or high standard, social standard, which may or may not itself be a realistic possibility. Many people think it's not. For purposes of this argument, that doesn't matter. Um, Marcuse's argument about pure tolerance, or that kind of non-interference with expression, takes a second step, a more practical step in a way, suggesting very controversially, of course, that certain carefully identified acts of what he calls selective intolerance might have a remedial effect. Okay? So if you had all the other ingredients, the ingredient of non-interference would be really good. They're missing. Now it's not necessarily good. It doesn't follow that it's good. And in fact, he thinks it's bad. What would be better now, given that those other ingredients are missing, is certain kinds of selective intolerance. He has in mind activists pulling the plug on you know, Vietnam War advocates or picketing to keep people from getting in. Not just more speech, but ways of interfering with expression. Now, of course, that's controversial, um, um, but the point is you can see the countervailing deviation idea and the use of the idea of the fallacy of approximation. The idea is it would involve a further deviation from the ideal scenario. First, you have the deviation that people aren't equally um, positioned with respect to power over the communicative landscape. That's one deviation. And we can't or won't remedy that, say. Well, then non-interference with speech, he thinks, doesn't have and he actually has in mind epistemic value. He says, the telos of tolerance is truth. So Marcuse is a perfect example here. If you want to promote the truth, stop non-interfering so much in this case. So his idea of selective intolerance isn't an institutional idea. It's meant as a technique available to activists. Um, but the idea of countervailing deviation is suggestive, obviously, of possibilities for institutional design, too. So. Uh, let's just briefly sketch one example that takes that form. Um, institutionalized countervalence, we might call it, can make a certain kind of distinctive sense of the device of legal restrictions on spending um, in political campaigns, just to give one example. So limiting political contributions, I think we just have to face it, limits speech. Um, so we can suppose that there would be no such limits in an ideal political deliberative setting. The real ideal is unlimited access, unlimited communicative access, right? So 
these regulations are quite foreign to the ideal. Um, so this is not restoring the ideal. It's a devi further deviation when there is different differential power of certain kinds. So my point is that it's not enough to show that, sorry, showing that it's a further deviation from the ideal, from the ideal isn't enough to show that it's not justified, even according to the values that underwrite the deliberative ideal. The idea is keep the values in mind. Don't try to approximate the ideal because you're not going to get all the crucial ingredients. Do what you can to approximate the values by having countervailing deviations. So it doesn't follow from the fact that unlimited contributions would be part of a good ideal system of epistemic democratic deliberation. It doesn't follow from that that we should institute unlimited contributions or protect them. So I think it's kind of interesting we can bring Marcuse and Rawls together on accusing the Supreme Court maybe of committing the fallacy of approximation um, uh, in the Buckley decision of 1976 that outlaws limits on contributions in a, in a certain way. One diagnosis of what's going on is they're sort of fetishizing this non-interference thing because that's one ingredient in the aspirational ideal. And the fallacy of approximation says, yes, it is. But it only has value when what Rawls calls the fair value of political liberties is present. When it's not, you might have to further deviate from the ideal by limiting contributions to keep um, the value, the epistemic value, let's suppose, in, case, uh, in, in place. OK, I'm done. Let me just one sort of sum up a little bit about this last point. So the justification of these restrictions on speech, I, I think you have to face it. That's what they are. They make use of the ideal, but not simply as like an intellectual construction to study, um, which I have nothing against. But um, nor is it as a goal to be promoted or as approximated. It's not doing any of those things. But it's what we might call a template um, against which to identify epistemically offending features in order to see if you can use admittedly non-deliberative uh, techniques or structures for the purposes of countervailing the distortions that are the other distortions that are going to be present um, in any case. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. So uh, first of all I want to thank David for this really interesting and thoughtful opening paper. Um, since I'm sure many of you have questions, I will try and keep my comments uh, relatively brief. So, as David uh, said, the kind of backdrop for this paper is the question about what value normative political ideals can have for us, um, and perhaps especially when we might think that those ideals can't be fully realised. Um, and particularly, as David said in the first part of the paper, in the light of the, the problem of second best, or as he recasts the idea, the fallacy of approximation. So I want to I want to just grant um, what I think is very plausible the stuff that goes on about the broadening of scope about the fallacy of approximation in the first part of the paper and concentrate my comments on the second part about uh, the case of countervailing uh, deviation. Um, so just to try and uh, just to articulate how I read uh, the the idea of countervailing deviation in the paper before I go on to make some critical remarks. So cases of countervailing deviation aren't just attempts to approximate the ideal or the ideal conditions as closely as possible by enacting or removing certain conditions, so various rights um, or imbalances of power in the negative case. Rather, they introduce a new condition, no part of the ideal condition in any way, with the intention of countervailing, or you might say neutralizing a negative condition that currently obtains. So to use the example that David was just discussing, we might not actually have reason to tolerate all forms of free speech, which we can assume ideally we would in fact do, in conditions where there's some significant lack of equality, um, political or economic in power, right, which distorts the epistemic effect of the deliberative procedure in some important way. And we do this not in order to approximate the ideal, right, because we're moving further away, but in order to counteract the negative effects of unequal power, epistemically speaking, at least in this context. So I've got two questions about uh, countervailing deviation and its practical value. The first is just how significant is the distinction between countervailing deviation and approximation? So, so far as I can see, um, identifying a distinction between the two depends on distinguishing between approximating the conditions of an ideal and approximating the value of an ideal. Whether we ought or ought not to enact the conditions of an ideal 
or engage or refrain from engaging in acts of counterfeiting uh, deviation depends in both cases on the extent to which our actions will promote the underlying value. So again, just say epistemic value. So I want to suggest the way in which the ideal has practical value in the two cases is in the end identical. Uh, it enables us to potentially recognize a gap between the ideal and the status quo in terms of value and then consider which actions may better approximate this value in our circumstances. Second, and this is more, I guess, a comment and an invitation maybe to say more uh, than a question, I want to put pressure on the extent to which uh, an ideal can be action guiding in either of the senses in light of the fallacy uh, of approximation in the discussion David has about the fallacy of approximation. So David plausibly argues, I think, that we can't infer from the gap between the status quo and the ideal that we've got reason to approximate the conditions of an ideal, just taking such an ideal as given. But for the same reasons, we can't assume that we have reason to engage in acts of countervailing deviation, just because in the ideal situation, uh, full rights to free speech would be coupled with rough equality of power. It doesn't follow that where there's not rough equality of power, we have reason to limit the free speech of the powerful. Perhaps, given current social conditions, we'll make things worse by doing so because the wealthy and powerful uh, are, say, better educated and so are more epistemically rel reliable than the rest of us. In general terms, then, we might say that an important lesson of the fallacy of approximation is that just because there's a gap between the ideal and the status quo, we can't infer that we've got reason to do anything whatsoever, because we might, in fact, already be in the next best realizable state of affairs. And this applies both to cases of countervailing deviation and approximation, as so far as I can tell. At the same time, we can't suppose we have reason to do nothing. Limiting free speech might counterfeit our epistemic disvalue of the current procedure. And more important, I think, in light of what David says in the first part of the paper, um, approximating directly the conditions of the ideal might be the right thing to do, precisely insofar as it promotes epistemic value. This means that a gap between the ideal and the status quo leaves open the question of whether we've got reason to do something and, and what, or just nothing, both in terms of approximation and countervailing deviation. As a said, in both cases, it just seems to depend on the underlying value or values in question. So, to be sure, I don't think David denies this, um, but it seems to reopen this important, perhaps, pr uh, question of the practical value of the normative ideal, because we can't assume from the gap um, that we've got reason to do something or reason to do nothing. So, the question again arises of how the ideal can provide us with practical guidance. So, perhaps, it will be suggested um, that... In Essentially, in these cases, we just have to carefully assess um, the situation, considering the various values in play and how acts of both either approximation or countervailing deviation might, on a case-by-case -case basis, promote the values that underpin our ideals. This seems to me a fairly reasonable approach, but advocates of non-ideal theorising might reasonably complain at this point that the ideal provides very little by way of practical guidance, insofar as the ideal is now being understood purely in terms of the value, and say, so just in this context, epistemic value. So from the point of view of a citizen or an institutional designer, understanding the relevant values, say epistemic value, seems to tell me very little about what I have reason to do, especially in light of the complications discussed in the paper. So just to conclude, perhaps what we really need and perhaps much to our benefit sitting here, is more theory, but importantly, a non-ideal or some form of transitional theory. Rather than thinking that the ideal has direct practical value, that is, perhaps we should think of it as having indirect practical value via some kind of transitional theory. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks. Um, right, so um, it's certainly true that even if the identification of the ideal, which I take it you're granting, at least for the sake of argument, would allow us to identify deviations, which opens the question of are there any countervailing deviations. It doesn't tell us that there are or what they would be. And I didn't go into this, but even if there are, whether we should do them, you mentioned that, absolutely. Um, at least open the possibility that in this case, approximation is actually, you know, we should take the two pills. I mean, it leaves that open, that's true. So it leaves that all open. Now, does that mean it doesn't have any practical implications um, or doesn't have practical guidance? I think it doesn't show that. I think it has practical value if it says you can't assume you should do this. You should consider whether you can do that. Sometimes in, this ca in these cases, there's this thing to do. So that is practical value. Um, 
when we think of various normative, moral, political things that we say are action guiding, we don't mean always that they tell us exactly what to do, right? Moral principles generally don't tell us what to do either. They're very general and they don't know what the, they don't know what the circumstances we're in are. They help you, you know, consider the circumstances in light of the principle. And so I think this is roughly along, it, it has practical guidance of that kind. I, and I, but I, would, I want to emphasize all the things that, that uh, Richard is emphasizing about how it doesn't immediately tell you what to do. Somebody could read this and think that it's in favor of countervailing deviations any time there's a, uh, nothing like that. Um, I, th I think that's, that's the main point. I think it's a good one. I, th I, um, I want to see if I just missed anything. Um, I, I think you used the word neutralizing, but you didn't make a mistake that might tempt. So the countervailing deviation, we might say, neutralizes the initial deviation. We have to be really careful about what we mean by neutralizing there. It doesn't do away with it. So you did, right, we, have to, we, need, we need two dimensions now to get the point about countervailing deviation. It does, not, it does not neutralize or do away with the deviation. It doesn't do that. It's a further deviation. Now you have even more deviation. You have to go to another dimension, the disvalue that was caused by the deviation. It could neutralize that disvalue without neutralizing the deviation in the sense of doing away with it. So that, you, you, that was the point you were making, essentially, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Gloria. Uh, thank you. That was really an extremely interesting, extremely interesting paper, and also from an epistemological point of view. Uh, uh, I just have a, a question of, uh, just in order to say if I understood, because mm -hmm. I'm not really familiar with this literature. Uh, some of the conditions, uh, I mean, you, you can have I don't know three conditions, and one, and and, uh, and uh, uh, well, uh, one doesn't realize, and the second best would be just to uh, keep the two, and yeah. you say, well, this is a, a fallacy. Yes, but in, in a political realm, uh, many times, the t two other conditions are already, I don't know, taken for granted. You cannot uh, take withdraw them, for example, if, uh, if, if they are based on rights. I mean, this, uh, the, the right of free speech is already there, then there is, uh, so how can you con counter uh, instead of approximate uh, uh, countervailing by, for example, uh, questioning the the things that are already uh, in place. I mean, practically, it m there m must be situations where this is very difficult to uh, and 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 the and, and the best, uh, uh, the second best uh, is the most. Uh, I don't know. The, easy, the easiest uh, choice bec in order to keep, I don't know. So what's uh, the easiest choice? The second best. Well, uh, yeah, y because I mean, you have, take you the mean three the conditions. You yeah. mean the two pills or whatever. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the, if the two pills are already there, are things that people expect to, to stay. I mean, you cannot just say, well, we change everything. I mean, we, we cannot have a, an ideal situation, but we already have, I don't know, rights for free speech or uh, mm -hmm. rights for uh, gender, uh, I don't know, we don't have the third one, but we cannot withdraw the, the other ones. I don't know, can you imagine situations yeah. which would, would be socially and politically dif difficult to uh, um, yeah. explain so to people the second best is not a... Um, yeah, here's one, difficult, mm. trying to legally institute restrictions on political expression. Yeah. Very difficult. Yeah. I doubt it's impossible. It's just a matter of you know political circumstances. So. So we'll come back yeah. to that case. Um, so first of all, uh, and this ties in with something that Richard said, you might find yourself in a situation where we just are in the best available situation. You know, there's these logical points about the possibilities of countervailing deviation or restoring a proc. It might be anything we actually can do uh, uh, is going to make it worse. That, that's a possibility, absolutely. Um, and it's also clear that if you can imagine something that would be a valuable countervailing deviation, but you simply can't do it. Now, I'm, yeah. I restrict the use of can't to a pretty, that's a very strong modal condition, can't. So, but suppose I really can't do it. Well, then you can't do it. That's true. Okay. So if you can't do it, it's not the case because, that you... Yeah, because yeah, it's too true. costly politically, too costly socially, too... Uh, yeah, now be careful mm -hmm. because those aren't all convincing me that you can't. It's just you'd have to pay a political price. So can't is a very narrow thing. If, okay. we, if we want to let can't do the work of showing that, uh, uh, you, um, for example, you're not required to, or literally nothing you would try would succeed, that doesn't, um, mean, that you, okay. doesn't mean that simply there's some cost sure, you're not sure, willing sure, to share sure. or whatever. Um, 
So, and, and take the case of, as you say, there are some rights in place, like the rights of free speech understood in yeah. a certain way. Well, that's what we're facing with campaign finance reform. Mm. There's a certain understanding of free speech that seems to suggest that any restrictions on political expression doesn't. are bad. Yeah. That doesn't make it impossible. It's no, just no. an understanding you have. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Good, I, yeah. I, thank you. Thanks. Uh, then, is this might be a follow-up to the same? Uh, so I, I should preface this by saying this is really, really important, uh, okay. really important stuff, um, and uh, I'd like to see how it, it develops. Uh, uh, so this might be a, a continuation of the same discussion. In your presentation, you talked about things that we, you know, we we simply won't do. We know we simply won't do them, right? So let's not count that won't. Exactly. And I want to know what the status of that won't is. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, I was involved in debates about physician assisted dying in this yeah. province, in this country, where ideal circumstances would have the case that if somebody chooses physician assisted dying, they also have the option of uh, quality, high quality palliative care. Because if they don't, they're making a choice between physician assisted dying and some crappy alternative being stuck in a ward. And so the ideal is, and that takes a lot of you know, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of training, and so you know, the, the likelihood that we will get to the point where the choice set that the patient faces is kind of you know ideal, it's unlikely, right? It, and, and you know, knowing the way things are, you know, health care systems lumber along, we probably won't do it. Let's let, let's look at another case. Some feminists say that um, uh, uh, you know, prostitution is in all cases wrong. There's no situation mm -hmm. in which it's not a case to make situations better. But we don't have you know the reason why we should regulate it rather than try to. Um, uh, abolish it. It's because inf enforcement is either impossible or prohibitively uh, costly. You know, we have to have. You know, we look at the northern model and they see that uh, what that's done is it has eliminated prostitution is just driven it far underground. But I take it in this example, you do and want so the won't version, not the can't. Not impossible, not prohibitive, but so we don't. We're not going to do it. So, so you that's know, what you want, right? Imagine devoting all of the, uh, you know. Um, uh, policing, uh, you know, resources that we have, <laughs> multiplying them by ten, and putting them all in the service of, of rooting out prostitution. We won't do that, right. right? So there's a difference between the wants in those two cases. One is we, we're, we lack the political will. Healthcare systems are kind of hard. The second seems to be a, a title. We won't because maybe we, sh you know, I, I just want clarity on the wants. Those don't sound like that different in wants. I mean, uh, sort of for, for the kind of normative reasoning that we're doing here. I think those are the same kind of won't. And, and you and I are agreeing, they're not cants. That's the they're important thing. They're not cants, but they sound different mm -hmm. to me. Sure. Well, tell me what the significant difference is, because for my purposes, I want to say, I'm sort of, sort of like, we're, we're on the same page here, that those are relevant wants that you should now reason. Yeah. Well, given that, so what should we do? Yeah. The second won't sounds almost like an impossibility. Like, it's a theoretical possibility. But I take your point is you want ones that aren't impossibilities. I just wanted to ask you what the status of the, of the won't was. Yeah. In your I, th I think we're seeing things the same way. Those are both non impossibilities. Non -impossible, okay. And they both, so they both do raise the question, even though they're not impossible, right. they're either unlikely enough or even they could be certain not to happen. Right. Then we should, then it raises the question, well, now what should we do? And then we get all these issues. Okay. Okay. And you, the thing is, this is, this is helpful too, because you can say, well, look, I think we won't. You know, I'm not sure we won't. Yeah. And then you can keep both things in your head at once. You might say, given that we won't, now we have the approximation and deviation questions, but keep open the possibility if the avenue opens up, well, oh, it turns out, you know, the moments come along and maybe we will, you know. So it's you can, you can keep both better. tracks open. Right. Yeah. Okay. So Arash has a point on the one. Yeah, yeah, it's on this point about the one. So I think that you formulate the position in a way that commits you to something that you don't necessarily need to be committed to to get the general point across. So you formulated, I think, if I understand you correctly, in a way that commits you to actualism. So you you make it the case that... In the deontic logic sense of actualism? Maybe? In the, uh, you know, the professor procrastinate yeah. sense of that. So you, you, you make it look like what I ought to do now depends on what will happen. That's how you're responding. Um, and if I understood you correctly, so what, what I ought to do now depends on what will happen or what is likely to happen. Um, and that is a problem, it seems to me, because it violates a couple of, you know, it violates a couple of important uh, principles. Like it violates um, agglomeration, agglomeration, joint, uh, joint uh, dis distribution, uh, joint satisfiability. Um, and so, why wouldn't you frame it in terms of? I mean, I you probably know the the keys of your argument about well, you should give it a wide scope formulation. So, what you have to make sure. Of, uh, what you ought to do is just make the conditional true. Uh, make it true that if you're not going to do X, mm -hmm. 
then don't do y. But there's two ways of satisfying that, right? Is you can make sure that you do do x, uh, right? So rather than saying that you ought not to do y, you ought not to do the approximation stuff. Right. Um, seems to me you should formulate it in the y scope way of saying, did I misread no, you? Because no. you're responding to Daniel in an actualist way, so that's why I'm. Uh, so I'm not sure I am, but it's okay with me if I am. So there's a long story here. So you're absolutely right. This is a couple of chapters of the book that this is all part of. So I take up the actualism, non-actualism, possibleism debate. Um, so, so I don't know how much of it I can answer right here. So let me let me say this. I'll just I'll just gesture and say these problems about agglomeration and so on. These are technical issues in deontic logic. Whichever way you go here, you have to give up an attractive principle in deontic logic. And you can get agglomeration back on a certain kind of actualist way of handling it that I sketch in the, basically what you do is you treat the concessive oughts, which say here's what I ought to do given that I'm doing something wrong, as a second ought, ought sub two now, right? So you, so these are logically different oughts. You get the ought, which is the non-concessive ought, and you say given that I'm not going to write the review, here's what I ought to do, that's ought sub two. And then you can get it. I'm just gesturing at that, but I think you can solve that problem. So it does raise these questions about possibleism and actualism, um, and all I argue really is that I'm, I'm going to assume a certain version of, of actualism that's at least as defensible as the um, um, alternatives. And so I think it's since you're spending time and on it no. in the book project, you, it is, you find that it's net, to get your general point across, it is necessary for you to take a position on this? Yeah, so, it's so, so the thing that I call actualism is so let me just say, it's, it may not be the full-blooded actualism in the sense that you mean. I argue that it has enough in common, namely it's sensitive to the actual, but it's not the full-blooded actualism that, it's not the consequentialist actualism of Jackson and Pargetter. So, that, so that's just a tantalizing uh, gesture. But, but you're right, that's exactly, that issue is, is absolutely important. Uh, very briefly on the Kiesewetter thing and the wide scoping thing, and this is very technical, I'll stop after this. Um, I'm inclined to think that the cases where wide scoping is appropriate are rather narrow, and this is not one of them. So wide scoping tends to make sense when if you don't wide scope, you get absurd results. It's not just that there's reason to wide scope every time you can wide scope. And I, and I have a little argument that this is not the kind of case where wide scoping is called for. And wide scoping is weird in some ways. So, so I argue that there's not a good case for wide scoping. But that has to be supplemented by I have this other way of handing, handling these problems. I'm sorry, a little bit telegraphic. So we have five questions left and 15 minutes. Yep. Uh, do you want to? You can pair them up and yep. just make sure I don't jump yeah. in them. So uh, Kevin and Peter. Great. Uh, thanks. So um, I think the, the first thing that I mentioned this to you before, I just wanted to see if you had anything to add, there, if you had thought about it at all, um, that it seems to me that countervailing deviations are really can help us make sense of core phenomena in political ethics, um, as in, you know, when should we uh, exercise, for instance, revolutionary violence, right? There might yeah. be certain circumstances in which, you know, uh, the electoral system is closed to us, the courts are biased, uh, all of the sort of uh, appropriate, you know, legal uh, remedies are exhausted, so what do we do? Well, actually, this can give us an account of, of all sorts of deep puzzles and dilemmas yeah. in political ethics, and I wonder whether you think that's uh, appropriate. And then my, my other question is, um, uh, on page, 13, you mentioned the possibility of rights that are sort of fetishized as part of an essential uh, describable ideal. And I wanted to ask whether you thought perhaps property rights might be an example of that, mm -hmm. at least in the history of liberal mm -hmm. political philosophy. Um, uh, uh, kind of fetishized in a certain kind of way. Mm -hmm. Okay, since, since the uh, original inspiration of, um, of your fallacy approximation comes from economics, let me ask my question in, in economics. Sure. So what I mentioned the, the statics versus the dynamics of uh, countervailing deviation. Because I think there might be cases where they come apart. Yeah. So to use your example, uh, suppose we agree that from a static perspective, we should limit freedom of speech in the absence of the equality of power. Mm -hmm. right? Now, from a dynamic perspective, over the long term, this might actually take us even further away from the ideal, from our overall sort of you mean even further from the value of the ideal? From, from the value yeah. of the ideal. So for instance, you know, uh, inequality in power might increase even further. Yeah. <coughs> not, but might. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, so this, I mean, in a way, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a fundamental challenge to your, uh, to your argument, but it adds another twist, namely that what happens from a static perspective and a dynamic perspective can come apart. And it makes it uh, epistemically a lot more challenging to figure out what we should do. Yeah. So. Great. I'll take them in reverse order. So it, it seems clear to me the dynamic approach is the only relevant one here. So if, if um, it would sort of temporarily restore the value, but predictably, you know, diminish it even more, then don't do it. So I think you're right. And I, I you know, the, the toy examples tend to just put us in a little static frame of mind, but the dynamic is really the question that you'd have to be asking when you're asking, should I engage in this? So I think that's a good, a good um, complexification of the, of the issue. I think that's right. Um, uh, revolution and doing away with property rights. This isn't being recorded, is it? I hate that publicity thing. <laughs> You're right, okay. Um, yeah, if you read the Marcuse thing, Marcuse's a, a revolutionary. And in that essay, he just, I just, he wanted it to have a wider audience, so he didn't quite call for the destruction of private property, but it was a, a seething critique of capitalism uh, and p arguably calling for political violence or condoning it under some, you know, it was a little cagey. So, but you're quite right that I think the answer is yes. I mean, um, revolutions are sometimes justified. Every, everybody knows that. But there isn't a lot of normative thought about um, that is a lot of thought about how normatively to decide when that's the case, as opposed to historically what would have happened if, what's the normative framework? And I think countervailing deviation is often, so p a possible next project for me once, if I ever finish this uh, ideal theory, utopophobia thing, is gonna be using these ideas in just this context, trying to treat in a unified normative framework, dissent, um, protest, sharp dissent, subversion, disobedience, revolution, and war. Right, a lot of the same issues um, come up. So civil disobedience obviously is in there somewhere, all that. So you're right on track. Property rights, I'd like to hear the argument. I mean, very arguably. So one thing I didn't put in the talk, but it's in the paper, which is I'm kind of interested in this very general idea that you see in, uh, it's arguably in, in Marcuse and maybe Charles Mills, who I mentioned, that there's a kind of fetishization of things in liberal thought that's not endemic, it's just a habit of thinking these things that would be ingredients in the ideal are inviolable rights, and property rights might be like that. They might only have their value in, this, in the package, and so it might be a, a case of um, a fallacy of approximation. Dominique and Jason. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think the point I want to make has been made already, although perhaps not as strongly as I'm about to make it. Um, as strongly or as well? <laughs> uh, well, as strongly at least. <laughs> and I hope as well. Um, the, um, the, theory of the theory of the second best, or the problem of the second best, I found as a, is one of those uh, loosey-goosey uh, concepts in economics, in the sense that it applies to basically all situations. There's always a sense in which when you're looking at reality, some conditions of reality will be approximations of the condition you would need for your model or for your theory, to uh, make accurate predictions, if we're speaking in terms, for instance. Therefore, you're always in a second best situation. And it's always possible to argue that you should change, you should further depart from the ideal conditions of the model to, uh, have, uh, to, uh, to uh, create outcomes that are closer to the outcomes that the model would predict. So just to use your your example of the, of the two or three pills. So yes, uh, two pills is a very close approximation from three pills, but in that second best situation, we, uh, it seems that we're gonna have outcomes that are very far from the outcome we would have if the patient would take three pills. But now even three pills is some form of uh, approximation of reality because it works under the assumption that the patient has some physiological properties or genetical properties that make him or her suitable for that specific medicine or drug in that circumstance. And it's always possible that even with three pills, we, we, we are still in a second best, third best, or fourth best situation, although we are closer from the ideal uh, situation than, that we, than we were in the case where the patient would only take two pills. 
Therefore, I just think that you can say anything you want with the, with the second best uh, theorem. Uh, and I would be careful not. So I used to use it a lot, in fact, and now I try to just avoid uh, using it because I think you can just say anything you want with that with that theorem. Yeah. So it's a problem. Uh, just, just one one last thing. Sorry for taking so much time. Just one last thing. In in my view, um, if you reach a sufficient level of abstraction, speaking in terms of first best, second best, or end best, really introduces questions about ideal and non-ideal theory in general, I think. It's as broad as that, yeah. I think. As soon as you introduce that, you're basically in the realm of ideal, non-ideal theory. That's so okay. for everything, you, you, you'll... Yes. I'll stop there. Yes, sir. You want to know yeah. some stuff then before I... Thanks. Go. Uh, okay. Uh, so, questions about uh, approximation and versus kind of real deviation, mm -hmm. and um, whether they're generalized uh, reasons to prefer one or the other in different kinds of uh, deliberative contexts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in the medical context, it seems like we should be totally neutral between um, approximation and countervailing deliberation, right? So two pills or zero pills, uh, whichever works best to bring about health, right? Um, and there's no principal reason to choose to go either approximation or countervailing deviation, just whatever gets the best results. And I wonder whether you think there's a difference in politics, whether or not in politics there are, there's, there are general reasons to have a presumption in favor of approximation over countervailing deviation um, because of the difference of coming to deliberative consensus in politics and as opposed to an expert's deliberation or the deliberation of a group of experts. So when it comes to coming to deliberative consensus in politics, you might have you know, a very large group of people who have, say, agreed to policy one, and they've agreed to policy two, but then you discover you can't implement policy three all of a sudden. Um, and there's a sort of political crisis in saying, well, we're going to throw them all out now because um, we can't have all three of them, because even though we've already come to deliberative consensus, a lot of policies will be consensus for one and two. So that sort of tends me to think that in politics there might be generalized reasons to have presumption, a presumption favor of approximation over um, countervailing deviation that we don't have in the deliberation of experts. <laughs>
now we're introducing concerns about non-ideal, ideal and non-ideal theory. Those are just, I mean, those are, it, it is, this is a, this is a paper about ideal and non-ideal theory. That doesn't seem like a problem of any kind. Yeah. Ideal theory is one way to reason. This is obviously a, a, a lesson about the relation between non-ideal theory and ideal theory. That's a fine way to put it. But I don't, but there's a skeptical thing that you want to draw from this that I don't see any argument for, namely that somehow these logical things about second best are never useful or aren't true, or you could just say the opposite. I don't see any of that, but maybe we should talk more about that. We have two last questions, uh, Zev and Helen. So thank you, this uh, wonderful. Uh, so I uh, wanted to ask how to conceptualize this uh, distinction between Kant and Wolf that's been brought up. Yeah. So if we uh, if we overlay this architecture on a uh, probabilistic framework mm -hmm. where um, outcomes are samples from underlying probability distribution, um, then uh, if it's a non-crazy distribution, there are all sorts of outcomes can obtain. Um, it might be very very rare. Yeah. Uh, but you know the if you go, if you have, if you're enough sigmas away from the mean, you're going to find something crazy. And so, um, it it seems hard for me to conceptualize a real can't problem in that framework. So uh, another way of putting it is to say that uh, my prior about the uh, occurrence of the outcome conditional on some deficit. So the, you know the deficit of what kind? Uh, so if one of the condition if one of the conditions aren't met. So let's say in the case of uh, the taking the the, mm -hmm. the farm to the pills, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, you have two pills and you don't. So that my my uh, my uh, prior uh, that uh, uh, the, that the medica medication will be effective, uh, conditional on only having two pills, will be either zero or one. Mm -hmm. um, but that seems to be an irrational, irrational position to hold that you that. You, you're not open to any evidence, and given the nature of the like probabil probabilistic world, uh, there's some probability. It might be it might be uh, very infrequent, mm -hmm. but it, it's it's just hard for me to kind of conceptualize uh, what kind of can't we're actually talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so it was more or less the question I was going to ask. I, I also would like to know more about the role of uncertainty, more or less, in your framework, um, and how because. I suppose that's sort of what you just said. The, the, the way you frame the difference between uh, can't and want, it seems to be very clear that we know in which uh, situation we are. And I, I um, am trying to you know, project that on political scenarios, and in fact, most of the time, we just don't know. So how does that affect the, the argument? I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of like, maybe a revolution occasionally would seem like a countervailing um, uh, yes. thing to do, but that might seem justified, but the reality is that uh, Anything could happen. Um, so, isn't there some kind of sense in which um, maybe it, you know it goes in the direction of more caution? Or I don't know. I, it's, it's not really a, um, an objection. It's more like how do you complicate your um, your argument, taking into account the reality that, that it's not zero one and it's not. We don't we don't even know if we can't. Sometimes you know we don't even know if we won't. So how does that does that change anything? Uh, yeah, in a way, I don't think so. That is, uh, nothing I'm saying here means to carry along the idea that we, that the agent knows for sure anything. It's just not going to be true. That's also true if I don't bring up countervailing deviations at all, right? If, you, if you're just an approximator, if you just think you're in a context where approximating is better, how sure are you that the consequences will be X? So there's nothing distinctive here about how sure we can be about what will happen if we do X. So, right? So just overlay all the uncertainty, and, you know, being a normative agent is tough. <laughs> we, we knew that already. <laughs> um, the probability thing, um, I'm not sure what the nub of your question is, but I can say one thing that's helpful. I think the relevant notion for my purposes is not impossibility, but inability. And they're, they're related, but more distantly than you might think. So probability shows up in, I think, the appropriate analysis of inability. And can't is about not able, not it couldn't happen. That's a different thing. S can't do X is not the same thing as it's impossible that X happened, or that it's impossible that it happened that S do X. It'd be a longer argument to show that those can even come apart. Okay? So here's a case. I think it's very possible that there are cases where S can do X. It's not possible that S does X. Now this is a, gets controversial, because if you're a compatibilist um, about agency and free will, then you can say, even if it's determined and so necessary that S won't do S, X. S might be able to do X, we just need the right analysis of ability. One might be, and this is the one that I defend, it's very just sketching a little bit, S can do X just in the case where if S 
I'm gonna give a simple version. If S were to set out to do X and not give up, S would tend to succeed. That can be compatible with its with determinism. It's impossible that S will ever set out, but we didn't ask about that. We ask, is he able to do it? And that just means if he were to try, would he tend to succeed? Yes. He won't ever try, that's a different so so that's the main thing is that the idea of can't shouldn't take us right to the idea of impossibility. So much of the analysis of impossibility in the sense of zero probability or whatever is not going to be strictly relevant. Great. Thank We're you done. very much. Thanks. Sir.